Okay, so we have uh, Lacasis has undergone a pretty serious conversion. This is like the the first big turning point in the story of his life, and now he's going to return to his, his homeland, you know, he's born in Spain, and attempt to petition a king, Ferdinand, uh, to get the point across that indigenous people should be treated properly according to biblical tradition. All right, which you know, at some level, amounted to amounted to uh, the law uh, in the kingdom of Spain. So let's see. So La Casa returns to Spain in fifteen fifteen. Uh, he did. He was able to meet with Ferdinand. And Ferdinand was sick, um, uh, pretty seriously sick at the time, but he did, he was able to get a, an audience with him and uh, Ferdinand promised that at a later date when he was feeling better, that La Casas would get a thorough hearing, uh, a proper official hearing of his uh, plea. Um, while he was waiting for this official audience uh, with the king, he produced a report and he presented that to the Bishop of Burgos in Spain. And uh, then in January, so he met with the king in December and then by January the king is dead. And so a promise of some future audience is out the window. Um, now, Prince Charles, who is the son of Ferdinand, is underage. He's a young man and not uh, actually in charge of things. So the administration of the government is held by uh, regents of the crown, uh, a, a couple of you know officials who actually run things. In this situation, in early 1516, uh, La Casas writes the Memorial de Remendos para las Indias, um, uh, an account of remedies for the Indians. And uh, he presented this to the re regents. And, and in this document, and, and this is something that now is, has been published sub subsequently after uh, I don't know, maybe after the death of La Casas actually, but is part of the you know historical record. And we have this document available to us. And uh, in this, there are proposals on how to, how to properly treat the Indians according to Christian law. And he suggests a moratorium on indigenous labor. And, and his concern is that the indigenous people are being worked so hard that they're being worked to death so that the indigenous population is actually just dwindling away under the severe uh, death camp conditions in which they are working. They're, they're working in death camps. That, that is what he is saying. And he is afraid that they will just die. This is like this is like Nazi Germany. This is, this is like Auschwitz. And they're just working the people to death and not feeding them properly and mistreating them and abusing them and, and just working them until they die. Um, so he says, let's just stop all labor of indigenous people just to allow the population to to replenish itself and just to come back to health 
We can also suggest modifying encomienda to give the right uh, to a number of man hours. So his alternative is, okay, let's not allow encomienderos to own or, or be privileged to be able to appropriate the labor of the indigenous people, the campesinos, uh, but rather give the encomienderos the right to a certain number of man hours, not just the labor of everyone that happens to live there at their discretion, but just some specified number of man hours. And then uh, self-governing bodies of indigenous people within each encomiendera uh, would administrate the number of man hours that they gave to the Lord, the, the encomiendero. He also suggested that there should be self-governing indigenous satellite settlements outside of the Uncomiandero, the Uncomianderos, um, each with a royal hospital, and he gives some sort of you know detailed sort of social engineering program of the way that these societies should be organized, and many of the features resemble. Moore's Utopia, and, and that's very interesting because this is the same year that Moore's Utopia was published. So, you know, there's some kind of cross-pollination between these ideas here. And he kind of envisions a, a utopian society for the indigenous people of the Americas subsumed into the Spanish Empire. Like there's a better way of doing this and that could actually benefit and be a kind of utopian existence for the indigenous people of the America. Uh, now, part of his, uh, you know, working out of the details is that, is that they could just use more Africans as slaves and um, and so you know, in his mind, he sees the African slaves as prisoners within a just war context, and um, as captives of war, they were it was legal for them to be enslaved because they were rebellious uh, and and taken captive. Um, So in, in the in the wake of proposing this now, uh, the regents of Prince Charles, you know, maybe influenced by Prince Charles himself, who is very young, um, they appoint three Hieronymite uh, monks to govern the Indies, and so there is like some kind of some kind of uh, some kind of uh, some kind of uh, coming towards Lacasse's way of thinking. And so um, this is the first time that you had religious figures being the governors of the Indies. And um, so that's quite a change in policy. And even De La Casas himself is given the title of protector of the Indians. So they create a new office for him and they gave him a salary. He was an advisor to those governors and um, he would plead the case of indigenous people against the government. So that was kind of part of his official role is to take complaints from indigenous people. And then he would send official reports back to Spain, back to the crown, back to uh, Prince Charles and the regents. Um, <clears throat> and uh, with that, then La Casas returns to Hispaniola and, um, 
he he sees that the these newly appointed governors, these Haranite Har monks, uh, they do see some of the young Kamiendas, especially those with absentee landlords. But La Casa's witnesses that the governors are by and large swayed by the complaints of the young Kamianderos. Um, and they allow the Encomenderos to continue practicing that institution in the way that they had been, especially the ones who are not, who were actually present. So they, they lack the kind of political will to actually enforce the reforms that La Casas had argued for back before the crown. And soon he has a falling out with the governors and he um, takes refuge with the Dominican friars in Santo Domingo, that's the capital city of Hispaniola, um, he finds himself, uh, you know, having to be protected within the monastery, having to set himself apart because of the abuse that he would receive on the street from the encomenderos and uh, other people uh, in the colonies. And so it was um, largely a failure. Okay. All right, so I think uh, I'll stop that here and then do a next segment. I just want to take this in short segments so I don't get ahead of myself here. <laughs>